and thank you kushal for such an interesting talk so next uh, talk, uh, is the next speaker is uh, uh, dr sundar rajan uh, from uh, ganda hospital and dr sundar has been ex president of indian protonagal society and of the indian arthroscopy society and he's been a very active uh, uh, academician and uh, participant in pretty much quite a lot of webinars in uh, regarding knee foot and ankle but foot and ankle i think is and he's also done live surgeries in a course we did in delhi so i think he's a re renowned uh, uh, arthroscopic surgeon good friend so dr sundarajan please uh, we are awaiting your uh, very interesting i'm sure talk on osteogonal lesions of talus and arthroscopic ankle arthrodesis thank you okay. thank you maninder uh, can you see my slides Yes, please put yeah. it on presentation mode. Yeah, thanks. Okay, sure. And uh, first of all, I want to congratulate uh, Mahendra and Santanu and Manindar for organizing this wonderful program. And uh, at the same time, I have to congratulate uh, Indrajit for the tireless uh, work to coordinate all this program from the last two years. Uh, and thank you for the opportunity today to to speak on uh, osteochondral lesions of the talus and uh, ankle arthrodesis. so the basically in the ankle we call it as an osteochondral lesions uh, because uh, like knee most often we can't talk about any cartilage lesions we talk separately like osteochondral desiccans but we are collectively called here as an osteochondral desiccans osteochondral fractures or osteochondral defects and uh, compared to the knee joint where you have a ocd is more common here most of the injuries uh, i mean at least 50% of them are due to ankle injuries and in that 94% of them are lateral lesions and uh, 62% are from the medial side and uh, the mechanism of injury for the lateral lesions most often it is due to the axial loading with the inversion and the dorsiflexion and usually it happens in the uh, middle or anterior part of the talus when you take about the lateral lesions when you come to the medial lesions the mechanism of injury is most often is due to the plantar flexion and the inversion of the foot at the, with the external rotation of the tibia and uh, you can see that the uh, lesions here more are the middle and posterior aspect of the uh, talus so how do we diagnose of osteochondral lesions as we discussed before the previous talks always the ankle is very very difficult to diagnose even the osteochondral lesions and you have to rule out all other causes before you conclude that pain is coming from the osteochondral lesion so there is no specific symptoms or signs or test to do and find whether osteochondral lesions are exist or not or that is the cause for the pain so always it's challenging so always high suspicion is needed whenever the patient presents with persistent ankle pain or if there are post traumatic or whether it's a present or past could be a suspicion there should be there should there could be an osteochondral lesion and also we know that any patients who comes with chronic lateral instability can have an osteochondral lesions so these patients usually they have a pain on weight bearing and sometimes they can have a recurrent effusions because of the osteochondral lesions occasionally if the fragment is displaced they can have a locking sensation too so on examination you can have sometimes effusion and synovitis the most specific finding is to find out to uh, local tenderness whether the intromedial tenderness or arterial lateral tenderness and also we have to correlate the tenderness clinical finding with your x ray and the mri so that this patient should be suffering from that particular osteochondral lesions so many times you can see there is asymptomatic osteochondral lesions is very common in the ankle joint so the x ray and mri is not the treatment so he has to correlate with that finding to the because when you diagnose some other lesions like a posterior ankle pathologies you can have an osteochondral lesions in the anterior side too so it is very important as we discussed before we have to treat the patient not that mri finding uh, in chronic lateral ankle instability you can test for even anti dry test that can give you a clue so of course we have to rule out all the differential diagnosis as i already emphasized because many differential pathologies can happen around the ankle joint so we have to see which pathology is giving problem for the patient so we should not treat that x ray or mri make sure that you correlate that clinical findings with your x ray and mri finding on plain x ray these are the different uh, uh, classification by burnt and hearty i think we know all uh, all these classifications with the impaction with the partially 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 displaced fracture complete non displaced frag uh, displaced free fragment or fragment with the tilt so before that 50% of lesions may not be visible in x ray when you compare to the ct mr is the most sensitive imaging for osteochondral lesions with a sensitivity of 96% compared to the 81% with the ct scan 
So tendency to overestimate the extent of the lesion also is uh, uh, possible in MRI. You can be concerned, of course, the, you can do the conservative treatment uh, when, the, when the fragment is not uh, displaced, in the, it is not lying loose in the joint. So in acute cases, we can immobilize for four months or you can do also non-weight bearing for six months with the gradual rehabilitation. In the literature, I had shown around 40% successful outcome in short-term studies. This is one of the study which we had shown that 14-year follow-up study. This is a long follow-up study for the non-operative treatment where the followed up are 22 patients, not the huge numbers, but still they say that uh, these patients had a successful outcome following uh, conservative treatment. Of course, they had a decreased in sport activity, but the functional outcome was good. This is one of the example of a 38 years old male patient presented with the pain and giving way of the ankle. That means the patient had a chronic ankle instability, happened two years before with multiple instability. Uh, that anterior dry test, which is uh, not very grossly positive on examination. But if you see the X-ray, it's not very classical to see the osteochondral lesions over here. But however, if you see an MRI, you can see that there is an osteochondral lesion over the anteromedial aspect. So if the patient doesn't improve with the conservative management, this patient underwent an ankle uh, stability procedure. And also at the same time, with through arthroscopy, we should manage that osteochondral lesion. So this is the scopy which you're seeing on the lateral side, where you see the uh, dome of the talus and the tibia, that is the uh, AITFL, antero-inferior tibia fibular ligament. You can see the opening more, more, more. any anterolateral instability, you can have a more opening on the lateral side. Then slowly, if we come to the uh, medial side, and you can see that the free fragment of the osteochondral lesion that is uh, uh, giving the uh, lot of sensation of locking also for this patient. So these patients underwent this uh, fragment uh, uh, removal after removing the, all the uh, soft tissue uh, fat pad removal. So you can see that is a loose fragment. You change the scope to the lateral side and introduce your artery forceps on the medial portal and remove that loose fragment and do the microfracture. So anything which is less than 1.5 centimeter, the microfracture can do most of the time. The most and uh, and I will come out with the literature. What is the uh, literature support for this procedure? And sometimes uh, this is another patient of 29 year old male patient presented with the pain on the left ankle for two years duration. Um, no restricted movements, but is a persistent pain. No relief on conservative management. And if you carefully see that X-ray, even though it's not very classical, we see carefully see here the center of the dome. Usually, it's very rare to have a lesion in the center of the dome, but you can see in that um, uh, coronal view, we can see that uh, uh, almost around one centimeter lesion over here. Of course, this patient pre presented with the CT scan too. So this is again an arthroscopic view. That is the lateral side. Uh, all other uh, part of the cartilage is very, very good. And you can see the only the center of the dome, you can see the small depression and uh, delineating uh, surf, uh, cartilage uh, from the normal cartilage. You can see the lesion over in the center of the dome. So even the dome in the anterior or the middle of the portion, it is easy that you can do an equinus, ask, ask, them, ask your assistant to keep it the foot in equinus, you can bring the lesion anteriorly. Unless the lesion is in posterior, then you can go posteriorly and do it. So most of the time you'll be able to do with uh, four mm scope or visualization. However, the instruments which you are going to use inside, uh, maybe to do the uh, removal or a shaver, you require a 2.7 uh, mm uh, shaver blades and the um, in, uh, small instruments which you use for a wrist. And you can see that is a, a loose fragments which was removed. And, uh, and also this patient was looked like, like a contract alsinosis with osteochondrilation, but I'm not sure. And uh, that was the uh, after the micro fracture, that is the lesion which had in the center of the lotion, uh, lesion. So what is the outcome of this fibrocartilage which is forming by micro fracture? So this is a literature support where it is published in the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery in American in 2020, this last year, where they found the second look arthroscopy and also they had done uh, uh, MRI too, where they found only 36% of the lesions were, in, I mean 36% of the lesions were incompletely healed uh, had, they had an inferior quality of the tissue uh, uh, compared with the native cartilage in the mean of 3.6 years. However, all these patients functionally they do very well, but uh, the second look arthroscopy had shown only, uh, I mean, 36 patients had incompletely healed. And also this is the midterm outcome of uh, systemic review of including 15 studies uh, with uh, 72 months follow-up where the, so they have found that uh, surface damage in 76% of the patient and follow-up MRI that could be an harbinger for long-term problems like uh, osteoarthritis in future, maybe in the long-term results, which we don't know. 
So what about the functional outcome and the return to sport? Many of the studies have shown, uh, this is a study which had found that when in 165 consecutive ankles in the published in the AJSM 2020, they found that very good functional outcome at the follow-up of 6.7 years, that is the midterm follow-up, that is a very good functional outcome, even though that uh, they have not mentioned about that MRI finding. What about the sports activity? Where the, this is on the other side, study published by one Nick, I mean in uh, KSSTA in 2016, where they found that 76% of the patient continue to participate uh, in the sports. Of course, not in the same level, but at least the, not in the pre-injury level. Uh, what happened to arthrosis? Uh, this is the uh, paper which, which had shown that review of 82 patients where they found increase in arthrosis by just grade one. So it's not very alarming. Uh, uh, in OCT, which was done by microfracture. So prognostic factors for microfracture, the size of the lesion is less than 1.5 centimeter. Acute lesions, contained non-shoulder lesions are ideal. Uh, however, there is no prognostic significance with the edge of the patients, whether medial or lateral lesions or with or without cyst. What about the retrograde drilling? So whenever there is an intact cartilage, again, it is an, uh, another procedure. We definitely, it's a very useful procedure where this uh, paper uh, supports uh, done in 41 patients with a good functional outcome. What about the oats or osteochondral allografting? Or we may not, we have that uh, PGCAT and osteochondral allografting, but oats which you can do, but it's a, where you can uh, take it from the knee joint and you can do an osteochondral, allo, uh, osteochondral allo, uh, autografts. Uh, it is uh, advantages are because it is replaced with the cartilage, almost is with the highland cartilage. Um, subcontrol are supported with the cancellous bone control. So whenever there is a big cyst, it is an ideal procedure to do. However, the disadvantages are the donor site morbidity and uh, sometimes you may need to do a medial malleolar osteotomy. What about the, uh, I, I didn't, I'm not talking about the allografting here uh, because we, which we don't have. This is the patient of 54 years old male patient had a pain and giving a for the 10 years duration with the recurrent instability. Uh, but later on the instability subsided, subsided but had a lot of pain. So this patient had a bigger lesions over here. So this patient underwent a BMAC procedure um, uh, by us by doing an after doing a middle malleolar osteotomy because it's a very big lesion. Uh, so we told about the, the prognosis and uh, did a BMAC procedure. This is the final picture of osteotomy and fixation. What about the literature support? This is the paper which was published in arthroscopy 2015 where they're done on, but uh, case numbers are low around 22 patients where they found that, however, if you compare the BMAC with the microfracture, uh, the uh, has got a better uh, Mockart scores than the microfracture in the bigger lesions like this. What about the ACI? We know that ACI is an autologous cartilage implant implantation. It involves the two-stage procedure where you take up the tissue, do the culture, then come back after four weeks and re-implant it. Um, these are the other procedures. Uh, you can, you can see that one of the case example which I did is an very old patient. It's a very big lesions of the uh, osteochondral lesion. I explained about the very, very pro prognosis, whatever we do, whether do a microfracture or an ACI or a BMAC. Even I offered her for fusion, but the patient wanted to preserve the joint as long as they can. So this patient underwent a two-stage procedure. I did a first cartilage tissue was taken and sent for a culture. And the second stage, you did an osteotomy. And it's almost a three centimeter lesion of invo involving the most of the dome. We did an ACI, but it's only a six months follow-up. So far, it's clinically patient is doing good, but I have to wait for the long-term follow-up. So ACI could be ideal for a bigger lesions because it forms more hyaline cartilage, and all, but it is a two-stage procedure. So this could be an algorithm for an asymptomatic osteochondral lesions. So whenever you have an under, unstable overlying cartilage, if the size is 1.5 centimeter less than that, you can do a microfracture. If it is a more than 1.5 centimeter lesion with a non-shoulder lesion that is an uncontained lesion, we can do an ACI, we can do an uh, osteochondral uh, words procedure on an ACI. But if it is in a shoulder lesion, contained lesions, we can do a uh, word procedure. If the large uh, least, uh, big lesions, even allograft is an, another choice which uh, we don't have it. So, however, this is the results uh, KSST in 2017, where I did a systemic review of 52 studies uh, involving 1,236 patients, where they concluded that none of the interventions showed clinical superiority over another. So still it's inconclusive, but however, we can just follow that uh, algorithm which we have shown. To conclude for osteochondral lesions, it is always difficult to diagnose and to treat. 
and high index of suspicion is necessary as symptoms and clinical signs may be non specific so surgical should uh, technique should be mainly chosen depending upon the status of the overlying cartilage size and containment of the lesion though outcomes of the most of the techniques are promising it is hard to recommend one procedure over another due to lack of comparative analysis um uh, can i uh, i think i will go ahead with the arthroscopic assisted ankle arthrodesis which i will uh, yes. maybe yeah another 7 minutes or 8 minutes so when you talk about arthroscopic arthrodesis uh, it was uh, a first description by sinder in 1983 and because of the advantages like a better pain control during post operative period and less morbidity and a faster return to the normal life after rehabilitation uh, advantages of arthroscopy is because we know all of us that there is minimum soft tissue damage around the ankle and less incidence of uh, complications may be a non union or a post operative infection and uh, literature has shown some other supporting the decreased time to fusion on the post operative pain reduction of course rapid rehabilitation and short hospital stay uh, of course the treatment cost really i can't comment on that because we may be equal in our scenario and the future total ankle replacement by minimizing the damage to the periarticular sutures is another advantage when you do an arthroscopy primary indications for arthroscopy is any degenerative arthritis of the ankle that is a cakewalk however you can extend the indications when the rheumatoid arthritis this is also one of the common scenario in our populations of course whenever there is an avascular necrosis of the talus but you had to be careful that i will come out with the next slide of course you can septic arthritis with the careful aspiration rule out secondary infection you can still go ahead and do an arthrodesis contraindications when the deformity is severe like more than 10 to 15 degrees i think better to go for a walk on reduction relative contraindications whenever there is an extensive bone loss if there is a poor bone density uh, neuropathic arthropathy and acute infection of course we should not do arthroscopic ankle arthrodesis when you come to the avascular necrosis you can see the literature support it's up to 30% of uh, talus is involved you can go and do an arthrodesis there are papers supporting or showing the failure if it is a 50% of involvement so uh, it is i think better to restrict to 30% of the involvement of the talus when you come to the arthroscopic versus uh, open fusion this is the myerson paper uh, which is even though it's a old paper but it has shown that the time to fusion is 8.7 weeks versus 14.5 weeks of open ankle arthrodesis when you come to the deformity correction i think the literature has shown that 10 to 15 degrees of deformity could be corrected with arthroscopic arthrodesis and fusion could be obtained even in patients with severe deformities of 25 degrees uh, with the expert hands of course the non union rate comparing the arthroscopic and open uh, which uh, the literature has shown literature has shown that 5 to 10% in arthroscopic compared to the 5 to 41% in open if you want to do an arthroscopic arthrodesis i think it's very important that you rule out the concomitant osteoarthritis of the subtalar or talar navicular calcaneal keyboard joint of course it's applicable for open procedure too so a weight bearing antero posterior x rays are very important to rule out whereas how much uh, whereas a valgus default to assess the deformities and the preoperative ap and lateral as I already told like a ocd but to reach the posterior compartment or posterior dome of the talus when you do an arthroscopic arthrodesis you require a 2.7 mm scope sometimes because sometimes the joint is very tight you need all the instruments which you use for the wrist like arthroscopic scissors or the shaver or the um, uh, 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 biters so it is important that you should have a both 4 mm diameter and 2.7 mm scopes and instruments uh, I don't uh, use any pump for any arthrodesis. I just use a gravity flow system that is more than sufficient. Of course, portals were already talked about. I use the posterior lateral portal to insert so to distract the joint to keep it uh, open, especially when you try to enter in the. Sometimes when you have a lot of arthrofibrosis, it's very difficult to enter into the joint. So sometimes I use uh, a rod, switching rod, for which you use for the shoulder. to distract the joint and keep it through the posterior lateral portal so that you can see on one portal and on anteromedial portal and work on the anterolateral portal either way you can change it over this is the case example of 70 years old male patient presented with right ankle pain and difficulty in walking for last 7 years and persistent pain not improved with the medications with restricted movements we can see that x ray there is an obvious arthritis with mild subluxation um, it's not much deformity over here and uh, when you do an arthroscopy you can see this uh, when you see in a chronic arthritis condition many times many times you will see a lot of arthrofibrosis you will not be able to see with the joint so you may need to do a sometimes a blind uh, 
uh, dissection in front of your scope to visualize the joint. So you can see the all the arthrofibrosis are cleared with, with your shaver. Then later on, you use the van. I think it's one of the very important instrument we require for an arthroscopic arthro disease to remove it, all the fibrosis quickly. And also, post-operatively, it reduces the bleeding when you do an arthroscopic arthro disease. When you, instead of using the uh, aggressive shavers, this van will help you to uh, uh, cauterize the tissues. And also, it helps you to remove the remaining articular cart uh, uh, cartilage uh, over the talus and the dome of the uh, talus and the uh, distal part of the tibia. As you can see, then I use most of the time, you use the aggressive shaver to remove the remaining part. And also it helps you to uh, expose the subchondral bone for the better bone healing. And, uh, and it, it requires uh, patience. When you do an arthroscopic ankle arthro disease, you need a patience because it is not an easy procedure to do a quickly. So you may need to sometimes to spend out and remove all the cartilages on both uh, anterior, posterior, medial and lateral. But you don't need to go into the gutters to do that. At the same time, you can no need to go all the way to the posterior. So only they, you know the which part of the uh, main part of the dome of the talus and the same corresponding distal part of the tibia, if you debride and expose the joint, it's enough. As you see at the end of the procedure, you should have that a good undulating surfaces. So that is very good to have a, a lot of contacts between these two bones so that the healing can be uh, quicker too. So this is the at the end. You then you do some micro fracture uh, with uh, your uh, uh, all. So that also helps you uh, to get improve the biology for the healing. Uh, uh, so that the micro fractures were done. Then you do a uh, image guided uh, uh, sorry image guided uh, pins, and that you can see at the end of the screws, you will not be seen able to see the joint after applying the two screws over there. So you normally apply just two screws over there. That is the final uh, x-rays with the six weeks follow-up. You can see that's a good consolidation is happening over here. The end of the four months, there is a complete healing. And that is the 10 months, uh, I mean, eight, seven and a half months follow-up. You can see that the patient uh, walks on that uh, arthroscopic ankle arthro disease. It's very difficult to find out uh, which side was operated here. So uh, you, this is the promise we should talk about ankle arthro disease. Sometimes when you do an arthroscopic ankle arthro disease, People may be wondering what the why the hell there is a lot of gap between over here. You have a lot of fear whether it is going to heal or not. So because naturally because you are you are not taking off the bone here because you another advantage of arthroscopic arthrodesis is you try you are maintaining the dome of the talus. In the same case you can see within the three months follow up there is a complete consolidation by when the, you make the patient walk and is complete healing with the complete uh, disappearance of the gap within three months follow up. In the same case at eight months follow up. There another patient of 43 years old female patient, uh, just treated with uh, uh, two screws, they heal very well. So the post-operatively, it is important that uh, whether you had done a correct procedure or not, the line is drawn along the uh, posterior, you can uh, inferior aspect of the posterior tubercle uh, to the uh, uh, most inferior aspect of the talar knot, which, uh, neck, which intersects with your um, anatomical axis of the tibia. So that means uh, you are at that angle uh, normal mean angle is around 106 with the angle in neutral. Compared to the open arthrodesis, when performing here, you are, you are not doing the posterior displacement. Because posterior displacement naturally helps you to recommend, uh, open posterior is recommended mainly to uh, avoid the stress on the knee because the anterior displacement can lead to increased extension on the knee during walking. However, by uh, you know, doing arthroscopic technique, by using the posterior placement of the screws, can help uh, the posterior middle corner of the tibia will bring the talus back in the tibia in majority of the cases. To take a message, uh, take home message, it's a safe and effective procedure. It reduces the operating time, but I, I don't think it has reduced the operating time as it is a literature support, but, uh, uh, it, but definitely it helps you to have a short hospital day, a stay and good indication in a degenerative and inflammatory arthritis without much deformities on bone loss. Of course, it leaves a high fusion with less non-union rates. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Sundar. I think that was a very enlightening talks there on uh, Taylor OCD and arthroscopic ankle arthrodesis. Uh, and I think we learned a lot of finer points about how to go about doing these procedures and the indications for the procedure. Uh, we will start off with some of the questions. But first, I have one question for Dr. Sundar. Uh, Dr. Sundar, what is your indication of doing an open arthrodesis? Uh, is there a certain level of deformity? that you use your open arthrodesis for, or do you do all your ankle uh, arthrodesis arthroscopically? 
Yeah, most uh, most often, Sonic, when you see a lot of deformities, which I have to correct, I don't uh, go for arthroscopy and struggle. Uh, so at the time, I try till still I do a open procedure. I always do a lateral transfibular approach. It is a very easy procedure. Yes, I showed in the last slide uh, short operating time, but it, it is not very true because it is uh, just is a literature support. But uh, it, because it varies from hand to hand. Uh, so yeah. when you do a lateral transfibular approach, I think the time is going to be the same. So people does open procedure, we no need to hesitate that change it to arthroscopy. But it's arthroscopy is a very good procedure when there is no deformity, definitely the time is quicker. Only the preparation time is, it takes a bit longer time, maybe uh, 10 minutes or 15 minutes, but it's definitely it's an uh, uh, ideal procedure when there is deformities are not huge. Okay, thank you. I think uh, Dr. Rajesh, do you have any comments on that? Do you do all your ankle arthrodesis arthroscopically or would you do the transfibular approach in some of the cases? Yeah, if there is no deformity, definitely I'll go ahead and do uh, arthritis. Uh, only if there is deformity, then uh, yes, as Sundar said, rightly said about it. Uh, I just wanted to ask Sundar about the OCD. Uh, you, you showed this defect right in the dome, the middle of the dome. Do you need a distractor at that particular moment? Because I find that this is the only role of distractor is when you really want to go intra-articular and go. Do you really need a distractor when you did that case or just plantar flexion was good enough? Yeah, that's as I suggested, even if it's in the middle of the dome, as I said, you just do a good equinus with your assistant, it brings very anteriorly. But maybe not very anteriorly, but still you have uh, some tight space over there. That's why it helps that uh, 2.7 or 1.8 uh, uh, shavers and the uh, shaver blades and your abiters are very much helpful. Here you cannot use with the 4 mm scope on regular yes. instrumentations. So whenever I do a, any ankle arthroscopy, I always have the wrist 2.7 and about, uh, all the yeah. instruments yeah. because I could I could not uh, use the forum uh, regular True. instrument. True. True. So here you also point. don't use the uh, distractor. Uh, I, I have never used a distractor in any ankle arthroscopy. So uh, I would like to add on to that. Uh, I do use the distractor, as Dr. Rajesh said, uh, and quite commonly I use it for the Taylor OCD. Uh, and because, uh, yes, you, uh, but I think if, if uh, Dr. Sundar, if you try using it once, you will find, I do find myself that there is a difference when, you know, I'm not using the distractor versus when I just put the distractor on and there is even a one millimeter increased space there. Uh, I think we can, uh, there is a small difference there when we use a distractor. I think the chances of cartilage damage are slightly less, but I think experience also counts here. And if you are able to approach that lesion comfortably, I think that's what all matters without damaging the cartilage. So I think experience really matters. And, uh, uh, that's uh, definitely a trick. Dr. Shantanu, do you have any anything you want to add there? Uh, Maninder, I have, actually I have tried distraction in my initial stage. I mean, I felt very cumbersome to use that. Uh, okay. And I didn't find much difference. But when you ask your assistant to give a good traction, maybe you need a good biceps for your assistant to give yes, a good yes, traction. absolutely. <laughs> to distract the joint. Uh, yeah. yeah. So I, I I didn't find huge difference. Definitely, I think for you, it might definitely make a, make a difference. So definitely people like, uh, many people like to use the distractor. I Maybe agree. you need a Punjabi person distracting the joint, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Right. Okay. Great. So, uh, yes, Dr. Shantu, sir, please. 